Um, I'm out of Colorado. My name is Andy Farish. I'm the regional manager for the Rocky Mountain area and in charge of our Western Division Lock Home Program. Um, I started with Timber Products just about 10 years ago, working down in Louisiana, Arkansas, down in the southern states trying to learn the sawmill industry. Uh, come back out to the West, quite a bit different actually that I've found. Very enjoyable. Um, essentially what we do as a company is third party auditing. Um, everything from issuing a trade stamp for a log home manufacturer, a lumber manufacturer, pressure treated wood plants, um, utility pole division, we get to a little bit of cedar shape and shingles. Um, anything to do with wood, we try to get an accreditation to perform inspections on that. Uh, Teresa Robinson here, and she'll talk about the log home program for you. She's the, the local rep out of the, the Utah area. Covers Nevada, Utah, where else? You can see we cover quite a bit of area. We travel all over the U.S. doing audits. Try to be familiar with every species and product there is out there. Um, we'll, we'll give some handouts to give to you guys with our business cards in case you guys have any questions down the road. I think most of you that work here know Teresa. Okay, so once again, what do we do? Um, we also do independent certification and inspection. So say somebody's not in a third-party grading program, they have a load of logs or lumber that they need graded for a house. A lot of what we do is we show up, we go through the material piece by piece, inspect it, and certify it for a grade. And uh, go by the grade rules, determine uh, species, moisture, and uh, grade. And that's something else we'll get into here in just a little bit, is how to identify that and exactly how the certification process works. Um, like I said, we do treated wood inspections. A lot of the pressure treated wood is changing year by year. There's big changes happening right now with it, where they're going to different chemicals. So we try to stay on top of what all the uh, the different uh, chemicals are and, and how they react and, and really what to look for. In. Uh, also, tr truss inspections. Manufacturer trusts a lot of wood you produce, say stud grade, whatever it might be, get shipped onto a truss plant. We'll do the audit for that, determine if if it's the right grade, species, so forth. Grade marking, essentially, like I said, what we do is we're auditing the stamp at facilities. Um, we give the facility a stamp, make sure that what they're producing is meeting the grade rules on that. It's again the grade, species, and moisture content. What's the purpose of stamping wood? Most people say, well, you know, I know the wood's good. We want to give our customer a good product, so we're going to ensure that it's good. Well, International Code Conference, ICC, what used to be known as, say, UBC, um, BOCA, it's now under the ICC, International Code, that says this is what a building has to contain. Um, say whether it's steel, or wood, whatever it might be, here's the rules that it has to go by. One of the things that they say is it has to have a grade stamp on the wood used to be just to mention lumber, and now it's getting pretty heavily into timbers and logs. Within the last um, month, it finalized the log building program through the ICC that's going to require that log homes have a third party stamp on the wood. A lot of counties already require it, have adopted it. Um, other counties that haven't have said, that, well, it's not in the actual code yet, so we're not going to adopt it. Well, now, they're probably going to proceed with this to go to print this year. And it's going to be really a big thing in the log industry to where uh, a lot more people are going to have to stamp and have the third party come in. So you'll probably start seeing a lot more agencies come out there and a lot more requirements by codes and building departments and we have to have stamps in the logs. And I'll let Teresa talk about the log home program and we'll move on to the heat sheet program. All right, firewood or house logs. We're just going to touch a little bit on determining um, whether you should actually just throw that log away or if you, if you could actually use it for a house log. The value of grade marked wood. Um, the grade marked lumber comes usually, you get your values from the random length values, which is produced on a weekly basis. But your logs are usually based on the truck load, the value of the truck load is something you buy or ship the logs. As far as, as uh, 
like how slugs go. In fact, you guys probably know how that works. You guys know a lot of How to grade lumber or logs. We do th uh, third party inspection one a, once a month we come in unannounced. Um, we have no idea when our inspections are. That is how we come in and check on the plants to actually carry the stamps to make sure that they're safe where they need to be as far as any grade stamp um, items um, with the logs and the logs and stuff. We all, Andy kind of touched on this a little bit. We can also do um, third party inspections on material that has arrived at a that it's not been installed yet. And everything that we do on this has to be spread out to where we can see every member has to be looked at, turned before we can actually put a grade stamp on it. And we can do that with lumber or logs. A lot of people get the misconception that the third party just goes up there and sees a truckload and says, yeah, this is good. Um, but we literally have to have every piece unloaded roll through it, see the piece 100%, same as a grader on a grade chain. You just have to flip the piece and look at all defects and then determine the grade. Very labor intensive. We usually like to turn people back to a sawmill and say, hey, you're better to have this grade at the sawmill prior to us having to come up there. It's going to save a lot of time and energy. Most, most times when we run into this issue is because they bought it at a smaller mill or a smaller facility that doesn't actually carry grade stamp material. And so then the homeowner has purchased it from that place and then it's got to the job site. And then that's when building code officials usually say, you know, structural, we got to have some kind of a stamp or certification on that material. The basics of grading. We're going to just touch a little bit on logs, grading logs here. Um, as all you guys know in the log home industry, that you cannot stamp a log as long as it has the bark on it. You've got to take it all the way off the cambium layer so you can see the actual defects of the log. But you can't see it until you remove all of that bark and actually see what's underneath that. Three items to identify, moisture content, dry or green, that seems to be a big thing in the log home industry. Proper reading for a moisture, media, moisture reading is insulated versus non-insulated pins. Insulated pins is going to give you the accurate reading at the very tips. Non-insulated, you're going to get a variance because it's reading all the way through your, your pins on a moisture. Does anybody know what the actual moisture content for a dry log is supposed to be? Green? What, what the maximum moisture content? Yeah. So classified as dry. As dry. As dry. Okay. 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 Uh, a lot of people think it's 15%, 25%. It is now standard is 19% or less with TP. You might find uh, another agency out there that might say 15% or 25%, but based on what uh, ICC and ASTM said, 19% or less is the standard for dry log. Okay, but now that's 19% using the uh, inch and a half needle, is that correct? No, that's using um, insulated, we use three inch needles. Okay, for logs, um, yeah. the depth for a round log is one six to one seven the depth or diameter that you need to go to. One six to one seven of the diameter. Yeah. And that's straight out of ASTM. Okay. Um, a lot of people tend to put those needles in an inch and a half and go down just in the top surface. But for true moisture readings, it's one six to one seven. Now, if you're doing a D-log um, or a square piece, then it's down to one fourth to one fifth. Okay, so on your proper your um, proper readings based on depending on your pins, inflated, not inflated. Your species, you've got to make sure when you're doing a, a moisture reading that you actually put in the right species, whether it's stuff or hand for um, that all variances in your moisture. I don't think we talked about the, the incorrect species corrections. That's another part of the meter that if you put in the wrong species, you're going to get the totally wrong result in it. It's pretty key to, if you're running just logical, plug in logical time. Most of the time it's an SPF setting that you put in there. Um, 
So you can see the differences if you plug in a dug fir versus a uh, southern yellow pine, you can come up with some pretty drastic differences in what you need to do. Yeah, so always make sure that's really important. Make sure that when you are sticking something that you do have the correct um, species. Three items to identify. Species, of course, um, you'll want to know exactly what species it is, especially if you're putting a great stamp on there. Um, most everybody I know is on a western wood stamp, which covers every species. But if you do have a specific species on your stamp, make sure you know what species that you are actually running. Just you? Yeah, I threw this slide in. This is uh, some northern white cedar. Uh, we've received a few loads of that in Colorado. So species identification is pretty tough sometimes. Um, we see almost every species. When it comes to something like this, boy, we start scratching our heads. It shows up on the job site and going, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to have to do a little research here real quick. So you guys probably know your species better than the sawmill than anybody. You know exactly what the logs are coming in. You see the bark coming off. Um, but species will identify that strength value. So, say Doug Fur's got a certain uh, fiber bending, um, tension, shear, modulasticity. Those are all the strength values that are associated with a piece of wood. You get something come in that uh, you guys aren't sure about. If it's a western softwood, you can use a combination species like Teresa indicated called the western wood. What happens though is your stress values are dropped to the lowest species design value in that. If you have a bunch of dug fur and you're putting a western wood stamp on, it's no different than coming up and putting all ponderosa pine in there on your street level. So you might lose some of the engineering um, aspects of that when it comes to uh, you know, a dug fur. It's so strong, they're going to have to go down to that lowest rating and maybe over engineer for the larger log, larger size pieces to accommodate for that. But, on the other hand, if you're to bring in a whole bunch of species, you're better off going with the western woods, then you don't have to worry about the separation of species. Now, you will get into drying things, which I'm sure you guys are aware of, when you mix those species, it's going to dry a lot different. Um, but it might save a lot of production time over if you all together and use them in one state. And grave defects. This is why it's so important to actually take that cambium layer off even if it's just a round log so you can actually see what you've got there. Wane, knot, decay, splits. Um, you never, timber breaks, you never know exactly what you're going to find underneath that, that bark. Slope of grain, shake, uh, your actual decay. The heat treat program, this is uh really been in since 90, you know, 2002, 2001, somewhere. Heat treat program really developed. Uh, you guys, it, who's not familiar with the HT program and you know, what it means? I mean, it's a little bit familiar. Okay, we'll get into the, the bone, meat and bone for this thing. Start with the European Union. Was basically, the first one's requiring the wood packaging material to be treated. Um, Essentially, what they said is they didn't want their forests to be destroyed by importing crates and pallets, bringing over the bugs, uh, basically called bug wood, is what they were kind of calling it in the beginning. So they took up measures to say, okay, you may importing into the European Union, uh, mainly as first from the U.S., uh, but other countries that had to be heat treated wood, which is run through a run through a uh, basically a kiln or a chamber and heated to a temperature, and we'll get into that here in just a sec, that shows that it's killed what's called a soft wood nematode, um, and they call it bug-free wood, essentially. It used to be an old bug logo, we'll get into the new logo here in just a bit, but it's a, a logo with a little bug that had an X in it, that's how they were saying anybody that was stamped in a crate or box or a pallet going overseas would have that little stamp on it. Well, some wise guy got this idea that um, he was going to patent that logo to make a lot of money. So he went and patented that thing, and all of a sudden, all this international symbol here could no longer be used without paying royalties to the guy who was the logo. So we cut the little logo off, got rid of it, and it was just a heat treat symbol. 
and they've developed, they tried to come up with a new one that showed an international symbol for all countries shipping into every other country that would say, this is an key chain product that has been bug free essentially. Well, every time they started doing that, somebody patented on it. So they actually had one of the guys who came up with a new logo overnight, didn't tell anybody about it, went straight down to the patent office and got it patented. And then he came out and said, okay, here's our new logo. The way the program works is the United States Department of Agriculture um, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services are the ones that are the real oversight for the U.S. to say, okay, these are the procedures that, uh, that we have to have for trades and boxes to leave in the U.S. to be certified. They essentially assign the American Lumber Standards Committee on the heat treat program to say, we want you guys to monitor this. Okay, the American Lumber Standards Committee that says, okay, third parties are in, are in charge of inspecting it. We'll oversee those third parties, such as chemical products, uh, all the other third parties out there. Um, and third parties go in, they do their third party check all the manufacturing, do the unannounced business just with like log and number program and QC records check, which I'll get into a little bit more. So that's kind of the tier level USDA, APHIS, um, Animal Plant Health Inspection, ALSC third party. And then we've also got plant protection organization. I mean, there are so many organizations involved in this thing, I get confused. Okay, there's two ways that a wood packaging can be exported. And when I say WPM, wood packaging uh, material, wood packaging manufacturer, it can be fumigated with methyl bromide. Essentially, you can take raw wood or a finished paper box. They come in, they tarp the whole load, they inject a methyl bromide fumigation into the, into the load, and then they put a stamp on there that says MB, IPVC, it's exactly like this stamp, it'll say MB instead of HT. And that's where you ask about the HT. That's why they put that on there, so that they can say it's either heat treated or it's methyl bromide treated. And when you get this into the methyl bromide, that's no longer seen by, by ALSC, it's still part of USDA APHIS, but then it's under um, NWPCA, which is National Wood and Pallet Container Association, instead of ALSC. Um, because it's dealing with chemicals, National Wood and Pallet Container Association decided to take it, and ALSC and C wanted to stay out of that. So it's two different entities that oversee the whole program. Once again, methyl bromide is overseen by NWPCA, constructed from heat treated, it is over ALSC. Okay, the heat treat program. That's mainly what you guys are concerned with. I wanted to show you the methyl bromide in case you have a situation where you have a load that you need to do, but you don't want to send it off to get uh, put in a dry kiln or heat treated and so forth. It's, there are options out there for people doing the methyl bromide application. But the heat treat is what I think most people are here concerned about. What is that? Heat treat means that it's 56 degrees Celsius, which is approximately 133 degrees Fahrenheit, for a minimum of 30 minutes. That's continuous. So once the core of the and that's at the core temperature of the wood. So at the core temperature, once it reaches 133 degrees, it has to maintain that for 30 solid minutes. If it drops down to 132 degrees, you've got to start the whole process over. Um, and apparently, I don't know if it's a plant protection organization, so that's the time it takes to kill the softwood nematode. And that's what the whole program is about, is the softwood nematode is essentially what they're trying to kill in the softwood. <coughs> now, they're now incorporating hardwood with that, but the softwood nematode is, is a, I shouldn't really call it a bug, because I'm not a forager. Well, so how does this affect you guys? I mean, pretty much you guys are doing sawmills, um, you're probably going to be doing a heat treat program if you're going to get into it. So, okay, what's the logistics of that? What's my production going to involve? Every piece of wood that you send out to a manufacturer to use has to have an HD stamp on it in order for them to accept it. You can't just stamp 10 pieces in that load and say they're going to accept it. If it shows up over there, they're supposed to reject that whole load because it doesn't have an HD stamp on every single piece of wood. There's a few exceptions to that. If they're really short, 28 inches or less, under one inch in size, um, under three fourths of an inch actual. Um, so there's some exceptions, but very few places can actually meet that criteria. Um, 
So it, a stamp has to have three things. It's the HT, the auditing agency, and no name or number. Those are the three minimum requirements when somebody receives a stamp that uh, allows them to use it to build their HD product, their crate or their box. Um, this is a little bit uh, jumbled here. Basically, it just shows the IPPC logo, the country of origin, HT or methyl bromide are two options here, third party logo, and then the Miller location marking. Uh, dunnage is the other stamp. This is a product that they, they have a dunnage on that says it's only for blocking, bracing, chalking, so forth. It's not to be used on a final crate. Um, so you can't just stamp a whole bunch of dunnage. Like this guy here just stamps this over and over so that it can go out and get cut into little tiny blocks or chalks pieces that will go up under and hold that crate in place or brace it in that container. But it's not intended to be used as a uh, manufactured on a crate even though it's the same process, it's indicated as dunnage for that, that separate purpose. So you will see that out there. Um, kiln sterilization containers. Um, so these must be able to meet a minimum core temperature, once again, 133 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, for 30 minutes or less. In a chamber, you usually use three probes. That's a minimum allowed by ALSC, strewn throughout the chamber where they stick the probes into the core center of the wood and they, um, they have to plug those, those holes when they're doing it to keep any air from coming in. And then they have to be able to print out that QC report on that that shows their time and temperature of what that load met. So we can go in and verify that they've met the proper sterilization times. If we prefer to see probes, a dry kiln can use, not have to use probes in their wood but they have to use charts that say, okay, my temperature in this kiln has reached this temperature, and we have to hold that temperature at so long of a time period in order to reach each week's sterilization. We found that your production, if you're just doing HT, it's taking so much longer to do that because the charts don't have that true accurate core reading. So they say, okay, we know that based on so much time at that temperature, reaching core temperature, and for every size, it's a little bit different. Four by four versus an eight by eight. So if you have a dry kiln that doesn't have probes, you got to use these charts. Larger the material, the longer it takes, obviously. And once you're qualified, we have to actually go in and spend usually about a day in your dry kiln to qualify that chamber and make sure that all your, your temperature gauges and all your heat is going to properly produce that. So we're sticking our probes in there, testing your time and temperature to assure that it's doing it. Now the bad thing about that is that you're probably sometimes going two, three times longer to achieve those maximum core temperatures rather than using probes that'll tell you right away when you're getting that core temperature. So if anybody that's thinking about putting in a dry kiln, the extra money that you're going to spend on probes is probably going to be well worth it. And you don't have probes, just try to find the largest material you can because once you're certified, say on four by fours, you can't run uh, five by fives unless you're recertified. We certify based on the largest material that's in your dry kiln. So that's always key if you think about doing it without probes. Um, Got to have three three probes spend full length of the certain certification chamber, um, and those probes must be sealed during operation. Um, Got to have printable records. What we do is we go in and we look at all those dry kiln records with the temperature and time, and show that it's met that and achieve the temperature. And that's basically what we're looking at. We can't, we're going in on a random basis once a month. Obviously, we can't look at every load. I've got a place that runs five loads a day in Colorado. It's a little sterilization chamber. So I've got to look through every single record and then do an audit when they're running, make sure all the equipment is uh, running properly. So QC records are the most important thing. That's something that's going to take a little bit of time if you're thinking about putting one in, is that you've got to produce records to, to track all the stuff that you're standing. Um, country requirements change all the time. Essentially, almost all countries now are requiring the IPPC symbol. Uh, right now, Canada and the U.S. is kind of a reciprocal agreement um, to where we require from them, they require from us, but there's really nothing that says, yeah, we're going to reject anything. So you can ship it up into Canada right now without the IPPC logo on it and they're going to accept it. 
Mexico is a different factor. They won't receive anything without the IPCC standard. And the same with almost every other country. So if you know that something's got to go out of the U.S., just better have an IPCC standard. Um, current bark requirement. This is a big issue right now. Um, the uh, individual countries can require debark wood, but the implementation of debarking has been delayed until January 2009. Um, ALC is currently taking samples on this stock, getting underneath pieces with bark on it, taking the, uh, the wood and pieces of bark sent off to the lab to see if it's been heat treated, if they're getting soft wood nematode in there. So it is still being tested, but because of all the factors of how much bark you'd be allowed and how not, it's really impossible to get that out. How much is going to be allowed, how you're going to determine it, I mean, it's a huge issue. So they've put this off for a little while. Um, I talked earlier about material coming back into the U.S. You'll see a lot of recycled pallets now with this IPPC stamp on it. And this is a hard thing also in the U.S. right now because you'll have manufacturers now that do nothing but take and repair a, a pallet that's got an IPPC sorted out. If that's not overseen by a third party, they can resell it and it's used. Any manufacturer that's in the program that's recycling pallets, they have to put back in the sterilization chamber if they're going to um, reuse it. Uh, essentially, you can see these things look pretty bad. And this looks pretty grungy, but this is a product that's either about to go in or has just come out of a sterilization chamber, met those poor temperatures, and can have that stamp and go back out. Okay, so our contact information, we'll give you guys some flyers here just that have some information. It's got phone numbers and addresses. Our website is a good source to go to to see um, more about the HT program and what it offers. Um, we are the largest inspection agency that does HT products in the U.S. Um, we have a, a pretty good manager that's the director of nothing but this HT program. So if there's a question that I can't answer for you, real specific, I usually put you towards him. He knows the ins and outs with all the conferences. and can tell you what the current regulation 